Okay, so welcome back to the afternoon session of this workshop on, on porous materials. Uh, we're going to start with Liam McCune uh, from the University of Cardiff, which I'm sure I didn't pronounce uh, perfectly. And uh, that's going to bring us uh, framework-less uh, porous materials. So, please. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks to uh, uh, Clement for the uh, for the kind invitation to be to give a talk here. Uh, it's, been, it's always lovely to visit Paris, especially when the weather's so nice. So what I want to do today is is to tell you. Uh, well, just first of all, I'll, I'll clear up where I'm from. Uh, on the program, um, I'm from Cardiff. I, I was at Cardiff for about five years ago. Now I'm from the so that's the Cardiff of Peter Gow, Wales. Uh, I'm actually now from in the capital of Scotland. So uh, I'd be very familiar to rugby fans, especially, uh, and uh, maybe shouldn't bring up rugby at the moment. But, uh, anyway, so I'm at the University of Edinburgh. So what I want to t tell you about today is, uh, is uh, porous materials that do not have a framework. So, uh, oop. That's not good. Yeah. So, um, uh, what we've heard about so far today is things like zeolites and uh, uh, moths, coughs, and, uh, and various other uh, fairly now traditional uh, uh, porous materials. All of these have in common the fact that there's a sort of three-dimensional uh, covalent bonded uh, framework, which, of course, helps stability. And in fact, if you went back um, 20 years or so ago, the idea of having porosity in a, in a solid material without a three-dimensional framework would have seemed a bit... Uh, a bit odd. Clearly, uh, nature doesn't like a, a vacuum, and therefore things would, would collapse upon itself. But uh, I'm going to show you in, uh, a couple of, of different classes of, of, compact, of, uh, of porous materials. Uh, the pins, first of all. Oh, I can't do that. Uh, the, the pins, uh, which are solution processable materials. Um, and these do not have a framework. And I'm also later on go to talk about uh, some porous molecular crystals, which also do not have this three-dimensional uh, um, uh, network. Now, but, um, the, uh, the pins are basically amorphous materials. There's no reason why you can't have porosity in amorphous materials. And, uh, but the, uh, the uh, porous molecular crystals, as their name implies, have three-dimensional orders. So why I'm particularly interested in, um, in polymers of intrinsic microporosity is because we're interested in, in separation membranes. And, uh, and, of course, it's a very complicated process to make a membrane in reality. Um, you need to have very good material, goes into sort of flat sheets or perhaps hollow fibre modules, lots of engineering, uh, lots of process development, and eventually you get a, a membrane that's going to separate something from something else, whether that be a gas from another gas or maybe pure water from, uh, from uh, salt water. Uh, this can be done on a massive scale, but there's a lot of, uh, of technology in there. What I'm really interested in there is, is starting with a polymer that's really a very good polymer for membrane separations. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, oh, I'll just show you what, uh, what I have here. Is This is a, a polymer of intrinsic microprosty, and uh, this is... Uh, Effectively, a polymer where the, the uh, rotation around the backbone is constricted by the structure. So what we have is completely fused ring uh, structures. And we, importantly, also, we have this what we call site of contortion, a spiro center. And this gives a, a very rigid and contorted uh, structure to the uh, polymer. This means that the polymer doesn't pack in space very efficiently. So what it, le it leaves what we call free volume, and that free volume can be interconnected and can act as uh, microporosity in a sort of conventional way. So this uh, microporosity is not a sort of very well defined, in like uh, such a, a moth or a zeolite. It's uh, it's got all sort of uh, random. It's got a pore size distribution. In uh, PIMS, for example, we have a pore size distribution that goes from around a you know, about uh, a couple of Armstrongs or uh, 0.2 nanometers up to around uh, point, uh, point, uh, 1.2 nanometers. So they have this distribution of porosity, and this is what it kind of looks like. This is what you get if you, if you do computer modeling of the packing structure in three dimensions. 
So this uh, sort of uh, green stuff here is the, uh, the free volume, effectively what's uh, what I call intrinsic microporosity. Chemistry is quite straightforward. We use this uh, um, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reaction of a catechol with uh, a fluorinated uh, monomer, and this basically forms a ring structure, and that allows the whole of the polymer to be a ring. So we've stopped all rotation around the backbone. The important thing about uh, PIMS is like, like uh, many other polymers, you can uh, dissolve it in uh, solution and you can either precipitate it into a powder and you can get, uh, uh, you can do normal uh, gas adsorption analysis like nitrogen adsorption and you can uh, see that you get uh, uh, surface areas around uh, seven or 800 metres squared per gram. Alternatively, you can cast it from the solvent and uh, you get bits, what, like bits of plastic really, um, and uh, that's basically what we'll be looking at. But the important thing is, the, is this solution processability. So it's very difficult in most cases for, uh, for these uh, um, uh, porous materials that are made out of three-dimensional networks to be dissolved or, or processed easily uh, into, uh, into films or coatings or particularly membranes. So this is a, a membrane, and uh, what we're after is, a, in this case, is a gas separation membrane. Um, and we're interested in a separation of, of methane from uh, carbon dioxide. This is a, effectively a size separation, uh, base, uh, a separation based on size difference. So in this case, the uh, CO2 is smaller than the methane, and therefore the CO2 goes, uh, diffuses through the, uh, the membrane faster. And there's two interesting... Uh, um, or two important parameters that we need for a good membrane, and one is permeability, how much stuff goes through the, uh, the, uh, the membrane, and the other is selectivity, the, uh, how uh, the membrane can separate one gas from another gas. And uh, there's a trade-off between the two desirable quantities. In, in, uh, in English, we, uh, we say, uh, you cannot have your cake and eat it, I uh, looked up uh, um, the Wikipedia page, and uh, this is apparently voilà le, le beurre et l'argent du beurre. Uh, excuse my French, but uh, uh, at least that's the clean version. I did. There was also uh, another version on there which I, I wouldn't put up. In any case, this is a, this is a trade-off, so two desirable uh, um, parameters, in this case selectivity and permeability. So you can have a, a very highly permeable polymer, but almost no selectivity. You can have a very low permeability polymer with very high selectivity, and, it's, and uh, you can actually put an empirical upper bound on these to get the sort of best case uh, compromise between these two desirable features. And this has been done, this is a, a, what we call a Robeson plot in, uh, in membrane science, and this, is, this defines the, uh, the, the best possible trade-off between permeability and, uh, and uh, selectivity. This is the one for oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and uh, I've put a few polymers on here. This PTMSP is a very uh, porous polymer, the most porous polymer known, and uh, this is a polyamide. This would actually be used in commercial gas separation membranes. As you see, you've got a separation of around six or seven, um, but actually quite low permeability, only around, say, five barra, it's called. Um, PIM1 actually has quite a nice... Um, uh, compromise between permeability and selectivity, so we're getting uh, something like uh, four uh, selectivity and uh, hundreds of barrow in permeability. So really what this is, is it, it defines the, uh, where this distribution of free volume is. So for a very permeable polymer such as PTMSP, your void space is, is in, in the nanometer range and that's too large, so all the gases can, can travel through the polymer very, very readily. Uh, for polyamide, it's in the, exactly the right range for uh, uh, sort of small, about 0.5 max, uh, nanometers, and that's the, uh, the, the sort of, uh, typical kinetic diameter for a, a gas. Uh, and PIM1 is sort of in between those two extremes. So there's lots of different upper bounds depending on which um, gas that you're trying to separate. So uh, an easy gas, and this is the first gas separation used by on a commercial uh, separation process, was uh, hydrogen versus nitrogen. And hydrogen's much more than nitrogen, and therefore you can get a, a very nice selectivity, and you get actually a very steep Robeson plot. 
So uh, for, uh, for uh, hydrogen and nitrogen. Much more difficult would be oxygen and nitrogen, where the kinetic diameter is actually very similar for the oxygen and nitrogen, and uh, you know, it's just a, a, you know, a 0.2 of, uh, of an Armstrong difference. And therefore, uh, even at, you know, at, uh, at very uh, low permeability, you're not getting a massive selectivity. So it's a very shallow Robeson plot. And this is the one that I'm going to concentrate on to show you the development of our polymers because it's a very clean uh, um, diffusivity-driven, size diffusivity-driven uh, separation. So is it really what I've been trying to do for the last 10 years or so is trying to beat this, this upper bound, trying to get uh, polymers with da data that lie above the, the upper bound so that we're getting very uh, good permeabilities and also very good selectivities. And uh, it's, it's not really magic. The, uh, the, the way to do this has been uh, known for quite a while, uh, long time. It's a very nice analysis by Benny Freeman back in the 90s. And uh, he basically says that it's simultaneous chain stiffness and interchain separation increases can be used to systematically improve separation performance. So let's look at these indi individually. Um, if you... If you increase the distance between the polymer chains, you're going to get more free volume and you're going to increase the permeability. So you'll be sliding down the upper bound because your, your, uh, your uh, distribution of, uh, of free volume will be getting larger and therefore you'll effectively slide down the upper bound. Your selectivity will also go down because there will be much more connectivity and much larger pores. So that's interesting but not all that great because there are very lots of, of uh, highly permeable polymers known. What much more interesting is to increase the chain stiffness of the polymer, and that reduces the thermal motion of the polymers, and so really can in increase the diffusivity selectivity, the size selectivity of the polymers. And that's a that's a kind of an interesting um, objective to uh, to do. And if you can do both, that's even better. You can get into a really nice region of the uh, of the Robeson plot, not just for oxygen nitrogen. This would also follow for all the uh, the other Robeson plots as well. So I'm just going to show you the development of, of PIMS by expanding out the, uh, the uh, highly permeable portion of the, uh, the Rosen plot, so going from 100 to uh, 10,000 barra. And uh, before PIM1 came along, we just had these various black dots. These are all ba uh, basically polyacetylenes. In most cases, there's a few polyamides on there. But as you can see, they all fell below the uh, 1999, uh, 1991 upper bound. And when PIM1 came along in, in 2005, uh, it's uh, considerably above the, uh, the, uh, the upper bound. It's a higher selectivity than you might have anticipated for the, for the permeability. And Robeson then sort of moved the barrier up. He uh, updated his upper bound and uh, called the, uh, the upper bound materials ladder-type rigid polymers, which is basically a PIM to, uh, to us. And uh, so that's the, uh, the data point that he used to... Uh, in 2008 to, to update his upper bound. Now, a polymer just doesn't have one single value for permeability. What I've plotted here is that all of the data points for, uh, for PIM1 that have been published uh, since uh, 2004. And uh, as you can see, there's a quantity distribution, a real data cloud. And you might ask why this is. And it's basically because the uh, free volume is not really fixed in the, uh, in the material, so it depends upon the, the sample history of your, of your film. Things like what solvent you, uh, you cast it from, uh, how long you uh, left it before you measured it, what the last solvent was, how thick the, uh, the film was. All of these can contribute, so you can get much uh, higher permeability, but of course you, you lose selectivity. But this whole data cloud here is all from, uh, from PIM1. Recently, we took a, a very aged sample of PIM1 and measured the, uh, the, uh, um, the permeability and found that we're getting up to, effectively up to about 5 for about 300 barra. So actually, as you can see, it actually gets uh, much more selective uh, when it loses this, uh, this free volume. And why that's relevant is that uh, if you make a, a, a real uh, membrane, such as a hollow fibre membrane that was uh, published a couple of years ago, um, the, the actual... Um, selective layer on these membranes are very thin. They might only be one micron, half a micron thick. And uh, so very thin films age very quickly, so real membranes age very, very fast. So this is after only about three months 
of aging for this hollow fibre and it's getting a selectivity of about five. So effectively for a thick film, you've almost got to wait four years before you really know what it's going to act like in, the, uh, in a, a real membrane. Well, what we learned from this is that you should make a much thinner film to begin with and that can age rapidly. You can, you can get this data now in a, in a few months' time, but nonetheless, ageing is very important uh, to give you the idea of what the final uh, membrane pro properties will be. So this is the, um, the ageing um, process. Effectively, you start off with, uh, with uh, pore distribution up here, and then as it ages, uh, it's losing uh, some porosity and losing size, and so it's becoming much more selective and but uh, less permeable. So after 2005, we were very excited about PIN1's performance, so we thought, well, that was the first one we made. Surely we can do make do better than PIN1 using the same sort of uh, rigid, contorted design principles for PIMs. And we did. It's very difficult work. Um, sometimes uh, your polymers are insoluble, so you can't tell what, uh, what permeability they are. You can't cast them into, into, uh, into films. And uh, sometimes um, they're soluble, but just don't make very, very uh, strong films. Sometimes uh, they are soluble, and you cast them into films, but then they just have pretty much the same performance as PIM1. And all of these are empty um, uh, triangles here are polymers that we made subsequently. But when you actually plot them all with all the PIM1 uh, uh, data points as well, you can see it's a cloud, much better than we were getting before PIMs came along. But uh, there's no real standout polymer in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, from these new ones that we were making at that time. So we sort of went back to basics and started doing some molecular modelling and trying to devise monomers that would be much more rigid, uh, give much more rigid polymers. And the, the first simple idea that we came upon was to fuse benzene rings to pin one at these points. So we get what's known as a, a spirobifluorine uh, polymer. And you can model this, and you get a much more uh, rigid polymer because the actual, the most flexible part of the polymer is around this spiral center here. And if you fuse a ring to it, it becomes much more rigid. If I um, plot this, it's very nicely permeable. And if I plot the age data, you can see that uh, over five years, it's getting up to a point which is better than that so it most put, uh, for aged PIM1. So it's up to about five and a half selectivity, and it's actually slightly more, uh, more selective over that time. So that's a good design principle, trying to get things as, as uh, rigid as possible. And the things that we've come, and, and, and other groups have also uh, come to the conclusion that uh, ethanoanthracene, uh, tryptocene, spirobifluorines, these are all very good, much better than the original spiro bisindan, and also this Truger's base uh, um, bridged by cyclic uh, unit is also extremely good, highly rigid. You can just work out the, the, uh, the energy cost in, in wiggling the, uh, the molecule about, basically, in uh, using molecular dynamics can actually tell you how rigid the, uh, the, the uh, material is. What I also liked about the Truger's base moiety is that it's, uh, it's very nice to make. It was you know, discovered in the 1880s, um, got the structure wrong in 1888, but uh, um, it, the structure was uh, elucidated in 1934. You just basically take an amine uh, stuke with formaldehyde or uh, dimethoxymethane uh, in acid, and you get very, uh, very high conversion to this Truger's base. And as you can see, it's got a nice, as far as we're concerned, it's very rigid, but also it's got that nice non-linearity to it, which helps the uh, contortion of the final polymer. So we could use this chemistry um, to directly make polymers. Uh, so we take the, such this, uh, this ethanoanthracene diamine here and do the same sort of chemistry that uh, Truger was basing, using over 100 years ago. And uh, this is basically what it looks like. You just stir it all together in, in um, trifluoroacetic acid uh, and then wait until it gets too, too much, uh, thick to stir, pour it into water, and then you can cast it into a, into a film. It's very easy, nice chemistry. And uh, when we then... Um, do the gas permeability measurements from this. But straight away, you can see that it's, uh, once again, a big step change that we're getting uh, very nice uh, data, for even for aged uh, samples, well over the 2008 uh, Robeson upper bound. We did the same trick. We actually wanted to make this and, and couldn't. It would be uh, it's too brittle. And, but eventually, we got this tryptocene-based uh, Truger's-based uh, PIM. 
And this is the same trick as we, I showed you with this uh, spirobifluorine. If you fuse a benzene ring to the structure here, then it becomes a much more rigid uh, monomer. And when you do that, you get a slight increase again in the selectivity. And uh, this has now been used uh, by Ingo Pinnow, who was uh, too impatient to wait for Robeson to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, revise his own upper bound. So he went ahead and revised it for him. And uh, he, using his polymer here, which is very similar, it's another tryptosine-based uh, 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 um, PIM. And this uh, PIM, this Trugas-based PIM from our lab, and he drew a, couple of li uh, drew a line through a couple of points, and that's the new 2015 upper bound. And it's quite an impressive increase from the uh, 1991 upper bound. Basically, for any given permeability of a, of a polymer, it's going to be twice as selective for oxygen uh, nitrogen. So it's quite an impressive uh, increase in selectivity by this using this rigidity. It doesn't stop there because we've actually gone back and measured the uh, the uh, the uh, PIM trip TB film that we've had lying around for five years now, and it's got remarkable selectivities up to eight for oxygen at nitrogen, and uh, still got uh, got uh, permeability of over 500 barra. So that's a really uh, yeah. That, if you could, could translate that into a into a, a a commercial membrane, you could re reduce the, the, uh, the, the area for your membrane probably by a factor of 100 or so. So that would be quite an important uh, breakthrough in membranes. So this just shows you the, the increase from uh, PTMSP, the original sort of uh, highly permeable polymer. This is uh, aged after four years, PIM1 aged after four years, uh, the SBF uh, polymer, and then <coughs> now the uh, PIM trip. TB. It's quite an impressive increase in the uh, selectivity by the design of the polymer. Recently, we've been looking at um, changing the shape of the polymer chain. So that the traditional sort of uh, um, PIM would have this spiro unit, and it will be a sort of contorted in three dimensions. Uh, what we try to do is actually keep the, uh, the, uh, the polymer in a sort of two-dimensional plane, uh, so you can see when this comes around, this is all effectively a two-dimensional um, um, com uh, conformation of the polymer. Um, we, uh, we got our collaborators in Florida State, there, led by Corey uh, Kalina, to model the packing of these polymers. And uh, it's hard to tell, really, but uh, if you look at this uh, um, packing density here, it's lower, there's more blue space, which is the free volume, than in this uh, um, similarly substituted uh, polymer. So basically this two-dimensional polymer doesn't pack three-dimensional space as efficiently, so there's more free volume left over. And when we plot this on the Robeson plot, we're up here, and this is basically on a, so it's pretty much the same as uh, the permeability of PTMSP, which is the most permeable polymer known up to that, that point, and yet uh, much more uh, uh, selective. And in fact, when you age this polymer, you can get up uh, up to and, and now actually beyond the uh, the 2015 upper bound by aging the polymer. So just to you, um, to conclude the PIMS part of the talk, um, there's we've been using uh, gas permeability uh, as the the way to drive the design of the polymers, but uh, other people have been doing other things with PIMS. There's there's a there's a commercial sensor for organic vapors which is out for uh, which has been developed by 3M. And it, you can uh, buy this on their, their respirators. Basically, it adsorbs um, organic vapours. And as it does so, it changes colour. And, uh, and basically, when this little red strip gets to the other side, you chuck away your, uh, your, your respirator. There's all sorts of other different applications that other groups are, are looking at. One that we're very interested in is using PIMS for, me, uh, for uh, batteries in electrochemistry, particularly redox flow batteries. Was in that case, we need a sort of hydrophilic type of, uh, of PIM, and we're developing those. And uh, Brett Helms at Berkeley is also uh, looking at this idea as well. So, um, so if you want to know more about PIMs, just look at the website, and uh, I've, I've catalogued all the, uh, all the uh, publications relevant to, uh, to PIMs that have come out. So back to this original slide. This is um, um, Clearly, we have PIMS here, amorphous materials, but without a framework, so they're solution processable. And we've also got these, these uh, um, lovely crystalline materials, porous molecular crystals, and uh, 
perhaps the best known example of these are, are, the, are Andy Cooper's cages from uh, Liverpool University, These beautiful cages that preformed pores that then crystallise and you can get some lovely porosity from these, uh, from these materials and, and very nice separation properties yeah, using them. What uh, I'm interested in is using porous molecular um, uh, crystals for really for um, catalysis, at least. Ultimately, that's what I'm, I'm interested in. So we have to introduce functionality. I think Christian made a very good point this morning that, uh, that all of these new uh, porous materials that are being devised they're not going to be good for everything. If you just want sort of high surface areas, then go back to activated carbons. If you want a very well-defined pore, you might be better off with a zeolite. What you're looking for is some added value, some combination of properties that, that these new materials can give you. And uh, what I'm interested in is, is, a, is a porous molecular crystal with potential cata uh, catalytic properties. And of course, you might argue that um, a MOF has metal uh, centers in there. Um, but, of course, uh, the metals in MOFs have to perform a structural uh, func uh, functionality, and it's not necessarily free to, it to, uh, to undergo catalysis. So I'm interested in, in porphyrin and porphyrin-like materials. Um, ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is take a porphyrin, which is a high catalytically active material, and just instead of doing any bond formation, just crystallise it out and get a nice porous molecular crystal. Unfortunately, this is the, uh, the, the paradigm of crystal engineering. You just don't know what's going to happen when you do a crystallisation, especially of a complicated molecule like this. And in actual fact, with all different metals, different ligands, there are hundreds of different um, uh, crystal structures just from tetraphenol uh, porphyrin like this. So it's very, very difficult. Crystal engineering just is not a predictable science. Moths are semi-predictable. As Christian was saying this morning, um, it's a, it's a semi-predictable uh, thing. You start off with an idea, but it's not always what you get when you start doing the, doing the chemistry. So I'm going to turn this on its head, and we, what we found is a highly predictable crystal that keeps coming back, and therefore we're going to try and use this crystal to do sort of uh, to, to to do crystal design. So what we're interested in is is thalassines, which is related to the porphyrins. It's basically benzo. Uh, um, units here and phenol uh, and uh, nitrogens instead of carbons here. They're highly aromatic, highly coloured. They're used as uh, as colourants. They're very easy to make on a large scale, and you've got uh, uh, lots of sites for substitution around the uh, the, the thalassine and periphery. Lots of different applications already, particularly catalysis. In actual fact, they're used for uh, taking out sulphur out of crude petroleum by oxidation, the Mirox process. So this is a, 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 a thalassine we just happened to make, really, and we tried to um, put bulky groups on there so that the thalassines wouldn't aggregate and that would leave the metal free for, uh, for doing homogeneous catalysis. But what we found by accident, complete accident, was that you get very big cubic crystals from the crystallisation and this thing actually kind of looked a bit like a moth when, it, when we crystallised it out. Very high, um, a, a PN, 3N cubic structure, the most notable feature of the, uh, of the crystal, though, is that each uh, unit cell has, uh, has two very large solvent-filled vo uh, voids, something like 10 uh, nanometer cubed voids in the, uh, in, the, in the crystal structure. And this is basically a self-assembled cage uh, from the, uh, the thalassinin. So this is that you get, uh, get your six thalassinins coming together like this, and there's a sort of little channel at the corner there, and uh, overall, the crystal gives you a, uh, a Schoen IWP minimal surface, and it breaks the symmetry of the metal. So you actually have a, what we call um, uh, the, the void, which is the yellow space here, and that's about two nanometers across from one me metal to another. And you also have the cavity, which uh, is one nanometer across from metal to metal in the, uh, in the other void space. So we, this is a... Cutting a long story short, um, we, we originally found that uh, crystal coming out with zinc, but uh, some like 10 years later or so, we've now put all of these metals in, and all of these metals uh, crystallise when they're into uh, when you have that metal held inside the uh, central cavity of the thalassine sign in, all of these metals uh, crystallise in the cubic form. 
And so just to show you a few examples, they're all pretty much the same uh, as far as the molecular crystals are concerned, but they all have this, uh, this uh, cubic packing arrangement. So it's quite a large structural diver uh, um, elemental diversity, just which gives you back the same uh, compound. You can also do um, uh, um, some chemistry on the metals. The metals are exposed. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the cobalt version of the, of the crystal. You basically put uh, some pyridine in the solvent uh, in contact with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the crystals, and then you do a single crystal transformation, and you see the pyridine inside the, uh, the void structure of the, uh, of the, of the crystal. Now, unfortunately, um, these crystals, when you take out all of the solvent, they just collapse, and, which is a bit unfortunate. So what we decided to do is look at the structure and try to see if we can do, use coordination chemistry to, uh, to uh, increase the, uh, the, uh, the stability of the crystal. And uh, we sort of call this sort of molecular wall ties. In a brick wall, you actually uh, have two brick walls, and they're, they're held together by what's known as a wall tie. And so what we uh, looked at was the distance between the, the cavity here, and it's, uh, it fits pretty much perfectly for 4-4 uh, four, four by, by pyridyl. So what we did was just introduce by pyridyl into the solvent that was in contact with the crystals, and then took the crystal structure, and the, crystal, the, the bippy sort of docked in between the, uh, the metals in between the cavity. And when we have done that, you could then evacuate the solvent out of the crystal and uh, the bippies were left, but all of the solvent and the pyridine inside the void was now, uh, now uh, vacant and these were now stable uh, uh, microporous materials. More recently, we found that you can, instead of using um, coordination chemistry, you can do a co-crystallisation with fullerene and the fullerene also goes into the cavity and stabilises the structure. So just to show you what uh, um, the gas absorption looks like for this, we call it a thalassine in unsolvated uh, un, uh, uh, nanoporous crystal, a very silly acronym, but uh, nonetheless, it's like these are the punks. And uh, so you get uh, nitrogen adsorption at 77K, you get a uh, uh, surface area of about 950 metres squared per gram, pore volume of about uh, 0.54 mils per gram. And uh, you can get uh, the pore size distribution from the nitrogen adsorption, and uh, you can see the sort of large, nice large peak at around uh, you know, 1.8 nanometers, which is consistent with the uh, with the single crystal uh, data. So this is quite a remar remarkably stable material. There's nothing holding these uh, uh, this these molecules together other than Van der Waals interactions, the weakest interaction, but. We can uh, take out the solvent, uh, we can apply a high vacuum to outgas it, and we can heat it to over 500K. Uh, uh, we've actually put them in a diamond anvil cell and, uh, and uh, squashed them up to five gigapascals. All of the, these things, uh, they maintain their, uh, their structure. But most interestingly, we can boil them in water or, or acid or base, and uh, they maintain their structures. And this is just you know, Van der Waals interactions. But of course, Van der Waals interactions aren't likely to be hydrolyzed by water, so it doesn't really uh, make sense. But uh, nonetheless, it's perhaps surprising. So what we've been able to do now, now we can evacuate the, uh, the, the pores, is that we can do um, reactions directly on the, the metal sites. And what we found is that the reactivity depends upon the wall tie that we used. So if we have a BIPI, it's quite unreactive because, of course, the BIPI is actually a ligand on the other side of the, the cobalt. But if we have a, a fullerene, effectively it's an open metal site, and you can get uh, chemisorption of, uh, of CO2 at one bar quite readily onto the, uh, onto the metal. We've been doing this at, uh, at uh, the Diamond Light Source, um, to, uh, which has a, a nice gas cell attached to the beam line. We've uh, managed to do a few other things. We've got this, uh, this, this terbium mix sandwich, uh, and uh, this is now a, a, a single molecule magnet, and uh, we've actually been able to get the, the magnetism from this uh, porous structure. And uh, lastly, very recently, we found that uh, you can actually co-crystallise the, uh, the thalassine with porphyrin, and so you can actually get porphyrins uh, that are now 
uh, cochreous lies with the, and, and sit inside the, uh, the void structures on the uh, inside the, uh, the crystal. So this is the last uh, last example. The co-crystallized the, the, uh, the uh, porphyrin with the cobalt alcyanin. Um, then we added the uh, the BIPI, all of these single crystal single crystal transformations that stabilise the structure. Now we've added the cobalt into the uh, into the porphyrins. All of these are single crystal single crystal transformations. And uh, this whole structure here has a BT surface area of around 500 meters squared per gram. So. By using um, fullerenes and the, the porphyrins, we've been able to now fill up uh, quite a few of the gaps in the periodic table. So we've got uh, any sort of metal that you really want into the, into the system. And uh, really what we've got here is a very dependable crystal system that we can change uh, all the metals and we can uh, um, put ligands, we can uh, put fullerenes and porphyrins and, uh, and, and actually we can stabilise the structure by using these, these things as well. So lastly, just want to uh, thank my collaborators. Um, these are uh, Peter Bird, Corey Clean, who did the modelling. Uh, John Jansen and Detlef Fritsch did the gas permeation work. I haven't talked about Franks. And Stephen Moggett uh, helped with, the, uh, with the, uh, um, the gas cell work and the, uh, the diamond anvil cell work. And just lastly, thank my group and you for your attention.